Um, and now I'm going to turn it on to Kayvon to talk about the machine learning toolkit in Galaxy. Just uh, I should have uh, communicated this. This is going to be one example of machine learning application in Galaxy. It's not specifically machine learning toolkit. But anyway, I thought I uh, mentioned that, but probably it was. It's not reflected in the title. So uh, let me share my slides. Um, so do you see my slide work? Yep, looks good. Okay, perfect. So uh, the topic of this presentation is resource prediction for Galaxy jobs. And uh, the motivation is uh, we have a lot of data. Uh, Galaxy's main server has been uh, collecting job run data since 2013. I believe that Europe and Australia have been doing that uh, since uh, a little bit after that. So uh, the large collection of job run data can be used to train uh, machine learning models uh, to predict job resources. And why do we care? Why is predicting job resources important? Um, multiple reasons. Uh, it allows uh, Galaxy to schedule a job on a node with just enough resources. Um, if we are uh, over allocating, uh, we're going to have uh, reduced uh, system throughput utilization. And if we are under allocating, then we might have job failures due to not enough resources being available. So, uh, doing just enough, I mean, allocating just enough resources for a job is important in that aspect. Also, uh, there's another application uh, uh, is that uh, resource prediction um, allows cost prediction. Uh, when we wanted to run our jobs on commercial clouds like AWS. I think this is something I spoke with Ennis. Uh, they are doing some research uh, or analysis on how much it costs to run a task uh, on the cloud, uh, given different combinations of uh, like, you know, uh, uh, the hardware that's available. On that so uh, this would basically reduce the amount of uh, analysis that they have to do because you know they get an idea like how much memory or CPU or job needs. So there, this is a continuation of a previous work that was done a few years ago, uh, predicting runtime of bioinformatics tools based on historical data. Uh, this, that research mainly focused on uh, job runtime prediction uh, with a little bit of work on memory prediction. However, the job runtime prediction is a wall clock time is very much uh, tied to a node's hardware. You know, obviously, if you have a node that has uh, more number of CPUs and more RAM, the job will complete sooner. Otherwise, it'll complete uh, later. Uh, so, what the point is that this is this this data is not really transferable across uh, different hardware different hardware. So uh, so if you learn the runtime on one node, it may not be useful for another node with a different number of CPUs, RAM, et cetera. And that research uh, also had uh, proposed some future work. One was to uh, uh, predict memory and CPU utilization. Uh, these are things that are independent of the hardware. If we know how much um, RAM uh, or uh, get an idea of how much RAM a tool uses or what is the CPU utilization, it's much easier to uh, transfer that uh, to a different node. Uh, also, the idea was that um, if you could create a service um, uh, that has endpoints uh, that will that we can query it for memory and CPU uh, utilization uh, for a specific tool. So um, this can be, this service can be called uh, by you know, uh, some other client that's trying to predict the cost of running a job on commercial clouds, or it would be called by the Galaxy server to decide how to schedule a job. So for example, you want to run a job, you, you're going to get the CPU and memory uh, utilization predicted, and based on that, you're going to assign it to a specific node. Okay, so the current work, uh, I created a new GitHub repository called Galaxy Job Analysis. And uh, I refactored some of the Python code uh, in the, um, in that, that, that was available via the previous work. And uh, I basically uh, cleaned up the script, documented it, and made it parameterized. So 
any, I mean, we're going to be training models on job, job run data. And what job run data we're going to train is now part of an input file. Uh, you can list all the tools that you want to train a model on in that file. Also, we're going to be training different models uh, on data. And the list of models is also specified in a separate file. So there are, there are two, those are two input files that specify uh, which models are we going to train and what data are we going to train our model on. Furthermore, these models have uh, parameters and the ideal value for those parameters is not known. So we need to basically uh, train a model for a range of parameters and see which one performs the best. So that's uh, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, that is also, we can specify the hyperparameters in the input file and the script would do uh, basically a grid search on all combination of all parameters and find the best model. So that's as far as training the model is concerned. Uh, so after the model is created, uh, we're going to use those models. So I created a fast API service uh, with endpoints for resource prediction. And uh, the, the fast API service upon startup loads the uh, model binaries that were generated by the training step, the previous step. And then you can query you know, different uh, uh, tools uh, for memory and then uh, CPU utilization. I further, I finally added uh, lots, lots of documentation on how to train the model, how to start up services, so, so on and so forth. So everything can be found on Galaxy Job Analysis uh, uh, GitHub repo. So um, specifying genre, 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 job run data. So I'm going to go through all of these items one by one in more detail. Um, so it's a CSV file, and in that repository, my repository, it's in the config folder. For example, it could be input files.csv, the name of one file. And each line in the file specifies path to job run data for specific tools. For example, let's say we collected bowtie to job run data from main. And we're gonna and the path to that file is in dot examples bowtie two. So we specify that on line one of that uh, input file CSV. And we also say which column in bowtie to CSV we're trying to predict. So that's also been um, uh, parameterized. So for example, if you want to predict the max memory usage, uh, the column in bowtie2.csv that uh, corresponds to that is named memory.maxusage in bytes. So, and then in the next line, you can specify a different tool, possibly a different uh, uh, column to predict. I mean, usually we just want to predict the memory or CPU usage. So. Uh, so this makes it easy to change the job run data uh, or the resource to predict. So these are all, you don't have to change the Python script. You just have to change the input file. Let's say I want to train a model on 10 tools. Then I want to run, I want to train the model on 10 different tools. I just have two input files. The script is unchanged and I can use the same script to do that. Or I want to predict uh, memory usage on these 10 tools, and I want to predict CPU utilization on the other 10 tools. Again, it's only the input file that changes. The script is unchanged. So this is one example. Um, the, it, this is a CSV file that has two columns, input file and label name. So input file, we have job run data for both high 2 and high set 2. We have the path to the files that were created off the job run data on main. And we also specify which column we want to predict. And now uh, we also can specify which models we want to train. And this is specified in a JSON file. Again, it's, a, it's in the config folder. And one example would be models.json. Um, each, uh, it's a JSON object. And it has a, name, it has a, a list of name value pairs. Um, so name is the name of the model. For example, random force regressor. And the value is also a JSON object that specifies models, hyperparameters, the class, and module name. Um, so uh, this makes it easy to change the models to train and their hyperparameters. So if, let's say, we want to train um, 10 models on the data that we have, and then we want to train 10 other models, 
we just create two JSON, different JSON files. One of them has the first 10 model, the other one has the second 10 model. Or if you want to update the hyperparameters, it's the same thing. We just specify the hyperparameters that we want our training to train on in the file. And then uh, you know, the Python script is again unchanged. Okay, so this is an example of a model.json. Here, uh, we're training uh, two uh, models, random forest regressor and expert trees regressor. Uh, the hyperparameters are specified under parameters. Each have three hyperparameters. This could be 10, one, I don't, I don't know how many, it doesn't matter. Just for example, I've added three hyperparameters for each. And for each hyperparameter, you can see there are two possible values. Again, this is just for example, you could have one value, 10 value, whatever. So I'm changing the number of estimators for a random forest regressor. I'm going to trade 50, then 120. I mean, ideally, I should have a value in between, like maybe 75. And then I specify the max depth of the tree, could be 10, 15, 20, and so on. And how the not max features are selected. What's the method for doing that? It could be automatic. It could be square root of the number of features. It could be some other thing. So uh, as you can see, it's very simple to change the hyperparameters, et cetera. Two other things are the module name and the class name. So when the, my Python script reads this file, it's going to automatically import the module whose name is specified there. And it's going to automatically instantiate an instance of the class name. So uh, you don't need to like, um, I mean, so this is done automatically as well. OK, so uh, we want to train uh, ML models on job run data. Job run data. The script is called regression. I'll probably rename it. That's not a, that's a too generic a name. Uh, but anyway, for now, it's called regression. It's in the scripts folder. It takes four parameters. One is the input file that we just saw. It's uh, this one that lists the uh, job run data files and the columns we predicted. The other one is the models, which is the JSON file we just saw here. So we say what data we're going to train on, what are we going to predict, which models are we going to use, and what are their hyperparameters. Uh, we specify two other uh, directories. Uh, two, two other parameters. One is the the last one is the models directory. That's where um, uh, after we try every combination of hyperparameter, we compare all of them. We pick the best one and we save the binaries to that models folder. So that's where the binaries for the models are saved. And the output file is also uh, it's a file that. Uh, on each, let's say we have uh, two job run data that we want to train on, we have two models. So that combination would be four. So we would have four lines, and each line says, what is the best hyperparameter for that model, for that job tool data, and what is the prediction accuracy on training and test data? Uh, so that allows you to compare basically different models, not just different. I mean, you, you're going to get the best hyperparameter for a specific model. But you want to be able to compare different models. So, for example, maybe uh, uh, bagging uh, does better than random forest, or the other way around. You can uh, look at that. You can you can look at the prediction accuracy and decide that. So, what that the regression pie script does? It does a grid search uh, cross validation. That's part of the scikit-learn library, and it's going to save the, the the buyer for the best model in the models directory. So, this is an example of the output CSV. So uh, we specify the input file, that is the job run data we're training on. The second column is the name of the regressor. It could be random forest or extra trees regressor. We get the best score, that's an R squared score. If it's one, that's perfect. If it's zero, it's the worst. And then we have a list of uh, the best hyperparameters are uh, semicolon separated next. So max depth is 15, uh, max features is auto, Number of estimators 120. This is for the first line. First, uh, the first line kind of is too long. It goes to the second line. And finally, we have the test data uh, score. Uh, we separate part of the data that's not used for training. When uh, we can evaluate our model on that, and we uh, store the score here as well. So. Um, Okay, so when we do this, uh, we're going to end up with some model, model binaries based on the hyperparameters that we specified, that input data that we specified, and also the models that we specified. So uh, 
The next step is uh, to basically use those models. So there's a fast API service uh, in uh, uh, the app folder that's called main.py. It's very simple right now. It just has one endpoint for um, you know illustrative purposes. Uh, runs on the local host uh, for 8,000. Uh, so upon startup, it loads all the model binaries uh, from the models folder uh, and defines endpoints for resource prediction for each tool. So for example, for Bowtie 2 memory prediction, there's an endpoint called Bowtie 2 memory. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that I'll add one for Bowtie 2 CPU later. And then we have different tools. They would each have their own endpoints. So you can go to uh, the docs page uh, to view the input parameters and call the endpoint, which I'll do shortly. So uh, let me actually show you that first. I think I'm going to share my full screen. Let me, let me do that. So. Okay, uh, do you see my terminal? Yes? Okay, cool. So, um, this is the uh, regression script uh, that trains the model. Uh, I've specified the input files here. This is for memory prediction. That's why it has the underscore mem here. Uh, I've specified the models here model JSON, the output file, uh, it's in the output folder, it's called output file mem. And I just say, save the models to the uh, models directory. So uh, the virtual, env virtual environment is activated. If I hit this, it's gonna try different uh, hyperparameter combinations and it's gonna uh, train the models, like the first model is being trained. And uh, this should be short because I only have uh, two models and two files to train on. But I wanted to illustrate this. I mean, ideally, later on, I'll be running this on full main data, but that's going to take a while. So I'm doing this short test just to make sure everything works fine. That way, I'll feel confident that if I start with some main data, it may take like half a day. I'm not wasting my time and you know, have to redo things because of a bug. So uh, that's, I think, the third model. Third, and this should be the last one. So this is trying different uh, hyperparameter combinations. So right now, as you can see, the number of estimators is 120, used to be 50. Now, I think. Uh, And if not, I'll, I'll, let's wait a few more seconds. I just want to show you the outputs as well. It always takes longer when you demo. This will finish in a second. I was right now. Okay. So if you look in the models folder, we should see the binary for these models based on the tool name and the model name. I just have um, appended everything to the name of the binary, so it's clear which is which. And if you if you look at the outputs folder, this is uh, our output file. So this says for Bowtie 2, random forest regressor, when predicting memory usage. Uh, this is the best uh, R-squared score that we got. And these are the best uh, uh, hyperparameter values. And this, the final column is the best R-squared we got for, uh, uh, for test data. And that's that. So now, separate window, uh, I'm going to run, uh, I'm, in, I'm already in the app folder. I'm just going to run uh, main.py. This should start the uh, fast API service locally uh, port uh, 8,000. 
go here and I'm going to go to docs. So this currently I have only one endpoint. I loaded one model. I have one endpoint. So you can see, um, you can specify. I mean, these names, they, they have to be more meaningful. I have to change that. So these are the size of the input files. I think this is maybe size of the reference file. And you could try it out, specify values. I'm just going to put some garbage values, but it should work. What you can do is you, you can look at the one of those. Uh, actually, I could, I could find some meaningful values. Let me see. This is bowtie to memory. So if I do VI, Config examples. Examples equal type two. So, um, so we're going to try to predict the max memory usage. And uh, the own file is this value. So, put the value, actual value here. Then uh, we have uh, input one. Input two, okay. So copy input one. Sorry, Kevin. What are these values? Uh, this is a this is a uh, file that was generated off main that says how much memory Bowtie two uses based on different input combinations. So each line. Yeah. Okay, but the one that you just copied there said to. What what's that value represent? I don't know that, but I have to. I'm sure. I think it's the primary key of the object. So like you're literally awesome. checking. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, so, so do you understand my concern? So what you're yes. inputting here is the identity of the input data set that you want to predict the runtime for. So you have an exact match in your data. So, uh, I mean, like, you know, you could just look at your file and see what is the actual value. Well, I guess what you would want to do is do this without actually providing input one or input two, because those are going to be different if you want to use this to predict something. Well, uh, my, I mean, I don't know about Bowtie 2 exactly, but this is the size of the input 1 and input 2. And those determine how much memory and CPU requirement, what the CPU and memory requirement is. So, okay. Uh, so if it's a size that's a little bit less of a concern, but it's also highly specific, right? I mean, I suppose there's probably just one file on main that has that exact file size. So is that, you know, is your model going to overfit this and just say, hey, this is that one particular file and I know how long that's going to take? Or is it really, you know, learning something there? Well, we evaluate the models based on R squared. So if R squared is close to one, we're doing a good job. And also, I should have uh, mentioned this. Uh, before I use this data, I don't use this data as is for training. A lot of these columns are removed. There is a method called re like remove bad columns. So anything that uh, identifies as a unique identifier or useless information as far as like uh, uh, prediction is, is removed. So maybe um, you know the main usage data specifies 30 columns but we only used eight of those to train the model. So uh, oh. yeah, so uh, you can execute this and it will tell you in this case, the Bowtie 2 will use this much memory. So um, go back to one. So the input one, input two, I mean, that must be the size of the reads files that are being input. Mm -hmm. And then the genome here is, uh, mouse, so MM10. Yes. So it has to be kind of one of the um, reference genomes that's kind of um, available as reference data. Sorry. Right? Yes. It's not like a arbitrary, just the genome length. Because you can have genomes of a similar size that have very different repeat characteristics that will could potentially require different amounts of RAM or time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's sort of specialized for the genome that you're um, mapping to. Got it. Right. Um, where is my presentation? Okay, let 
your uh, graphic presentation. Do you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So, um, I mean, I'm sure my this, uh, I don't know, I'm not a bioinformatician, obviously. I don't know the, all of these uh, bioinformatics tools. It would be a great idea to have a, like a code review and make sure like, I mean, I would have at some point wanted to show this to people whose job is bioinformatician and make sure like the input outputs and the predictions make sense. But this was for illustrative purposes without doing that yet. So that would be the idea. There were some fields that will be chosen as the ones who would decide what is the memory and CPU usage. You can enter those and get an estimate and then you can compare it to what was the actual one and get an idea of how good your model did. Um, so there are some current and future tasks regarding this. Um, I need to generate uh, fresh job run data because this research was done four or five years ago, and since then we have we have a lot more data. Um, the repository um, for the previous research doesn't have instructions or scripts on how to generate that. Uh, I messaged the uh, the owner, but at the same time I'm writing a script as well. I may be done actually by tomorrow. So this allows me to run the script on main and collect. Uh, job run data. Uh, I mean, it, it will be a larger data set because obviously several years have passed since last time. Uh, second thing is uh, we need to run this analysis on a subset of the tools only. Obviously, we have thousands of tools. We don't want to analyze all of them, and it's not necessary to analyze all of them. So uh, we care about tools that run often and tools that use a lot of resources, so a combination of those. So based on that, we can pick maybe 10 or 20 tools uh, and try collect the data, train the model, and provide the endpoint. Uh, one problem uh, with the endpoints is that each of these tools have different uh, parameters. And uh, if you have like hundreds of endpoints, you have hundreds of different pra input parameters. So uh, the end the service uh, maintenance would become difficult. So it is important that we only select uh, select few tools and provide the endpoint for those only when it comes to resource prediction. Um, next, I mean, another current future task is uh, make predictions on CPU requirements. Uh, we do collect some um, metrics when it comes to CPU usage. Uh, we know the number of CPUs used by each tool, and we also know the total time spent on all CPUs, and we also know the duration of a job, like from the start to the end, like walk off time. So we could come up with uh, CPU utilization by this formula. We divide the total um, total time CPUs divided by number of CPUs and divide that by duration. That will give us some idea of CPU utilization. So maybe. If you know the number of CPUs and we know the CPU utilization, you could come up with like a heuristics or rule of thumbs on how many CPUs we need uh, given a uh, uh, specific utilization number of CPUs. Uh, the end goal is obviously to uh, select those subset of tools, uh, train the models and verify them. Uh, make sure that we can predict uh, memory and CPU uh, usage, and then write up write it up uh, for submission to a conference. Um, I think that's that's about it for now. And uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, hi, Kevin. This is Michelle. Um, thank you so much for your uh, work. Um, I look forward to digging into it more. Uh, when I start looking at um, other tools or uh, similar input files or different input files that I could use with the same tools that you're using here, uh, can I expect to receive about the same R squared values? Um, I know your R squareds are pretty high. And from my limited understanding of R squared, anything above 65% is pretty good. So getting in the 90s is exceptional. And I, I just wonder, did, in your findings, was that pretty much the norm, like 80%, 90%? Uh, 
Uh, it was, but I have to uh, I have to add a caveat. Uh, this data size is not too big. Sorry, one second. Um, I mean, I, I think for a larger data size, we would have a, a better, more realistic R squared. And I have to look into see how the p value can be calculated. That way, we can say that you know this is not due to chance. So that's another thing that uh, got it. But right now, I mean, my main goal at this stage is debugging the script, making sure it works correctly. Um, because if I want to run this on large amounts of data, which may take hours or days, I just want to make sure everything works. So my, my, my goal was just focus on two small files and two models, make sure everything works. But yeah, uh, when I'm, I'm guessing that uh, if we um, run this uh, on a larger data set, we would get maybe lower R squared values. We'll see. Got it. Thank you. Sure. I mean, somewhat related to that, I, mean, I noticed you're using random forest regression, which is like super powerful and can sort of capture arbitrarily complicated functions. Mm -hmm. I would hope though, that there's a relatively smooth curve. I'm wondering if you've explored, you know, simpler polynomials or neural nets. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I will uh, probably try every regressor that uh, cycles <laughs> allowed to run so I'm, I'm assuming you know it'll be 20 models or more uh and then i mean this is going to be iterative obviously you know maybe at first i'll pick the hyperparameters in a wider range and then see which part does better and then fine tune the hyperparameters focus on that and run it again so maybe i'm guessing there will be multiple iterations on uh, the models and the hyperparameters i mean um I mean, this is the, uh, on a, I mean, rule of thumb that I've heard that if the fields that you have of our different types, scales, usually tree-based models work better. If they're homogeneous, usually neural networks work better. So we'll see. I mean, obviously I'll try neural networks as well, but my expectation is that these um, um, Tree-based matters, tree-based models would outperform it. I think in Kaggle, most of the winners are uh, tree-based models, whereas in uh, ImageNet, most of the winners are almost all of the models are mo uh, neural network models. So we'll see that that intuition holds. Okay. Well, I very much look forward to your results. Thank you. Um, so what, uh, I mean, so, you know, when, when you make this sort of recommendation, there is, uh, there isn't really a way, or it's not even smart to use like the optimum value, right? Um, cause you might, there, there's a cost to, you know, just giving it the optimal value. And I suppose then in like 50% of the cases it's below that or above that. So if it's above that, the two may crash after running for a while. Um, how do you, you know, do you have any concept of how to turn this back from predicted values to, you know, values that you can actually use, um, you know, to determine the job resources? I mean, so, I mean what, what we usually do is like, I don't know, 95 percentile, uh, you know, the upper 5%, those are going to fail and we run them again. Um, you know, what's, what's your feel on that? Uh, there are a couple of, like, I, th I can think of a couple of ways to address that. Uh, one is that, you know, if it just returns a single value, uh, whoever is using it based on their requirements can pad it a little bit. The other thing is that we provide a range or a probability distribution. I mean, 90%, I mean, you, you might say 95% of the time, uh, you remember requirements are below this. That way it gives uh, it gives uh, like you know confidence to whoever's using it to 
decide what's the best course of action. I mean, luckily you can just, you have all this usage data, you can, whatever rule you can, you decide, you can go back and simulate how it would behave and what percentage of jobs would fail if you'd applied it. Yeah, we could. We could. But, I mean, I, I didn't understand that R, R squared topic. Was that what you did there? You know, you, well, uh, R -squared you train it on half the data and you check with the other half. Uh, yeah, it compares basically the predicted versus actual values. And it's a measure of how much they, uh, you know, how much the prediction matches the predicted value. If it's one, we have a 100% match. If it's zero, it's completely off. Yeah. So do you, do you know the ballpark number? You know, if you just train on half the data set and you use that to predict the other half, do you have like a well, ballpark get... value of how, how far this is off? Uh, I get uh, a very good R squared, but as I mentioned, this is not a real data set. So I need to generate uh, you know, a much larger data set to see what the R squared value would be there. So. But is this the famous holdout training or is it not? Is that something else? Uh, I mean, I don't know anything about ML. Um, Okay, so what I do is I, I have a data set. Let's say I have 10,000 uh, examples of high SAP2 memory usage or CPU usage. So I set aside 2,000 for testing and I leave, I take 8,000 for training. That 8,000 for training, okay. I'm something called cross validation. That means I break it into 10 parts. Okay. Uh, 800 each. It's 8,000 to divide it by 10. That would be 800 each. You train on nine of those 10 parts and you test on the 10th one and you, then you alternate. So you train on nine other parts, train on the new 10th part and you repeat this 10 times. So you get 10 evaluations of the same data. You average them. That would be your training R squared. Then you pick the best hyperparameter uh, of your model and you come up with a model with a specific hyperparameter. Finally, you run the test data, which you did not even use for training, and you compute the R squared for that as well. So that's the process. So do you think we can actually eventually, I mean, you mentioned that your goal is to write a paper, but do you think we can actually use this, you know, to for inform, for instance, the selection of uh, destinations with a total perspective vortex? Yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. I mean, this if this service is available on the side, you know, I'm imagining the Galaxy, let's say, if you're you calling one of these 20 tools, makes a call to the service, gets a prediction of CPU memory usage and makes a scheduling decision based on that. And if the service is down, it's just going to go do whatever it was doing before. So adding a service to the... Um, process should not be affecting anything of bringing the whole galaxy down. We we'll just have, you know, call the service. If it's available, use it. If it's not available, do whatever you're doing before. So it's safe to use it and it could potentially increase the throughput. The more immediate uh, application would be what Ennis uh, was talking about. Uh, I think uh, Ennis and Keith, uh, they're trying to understand how much it costs to run different things on the cloud. And they did like a grid search. So they tried uh, running a tool on different hardware combinations and so on. Um, um, they kind of realized that, you know, if they increase the number of CPUs, et cetera, the runtime linearly comes down and, you know, all that stuff. So this could allow them to, you know, avoid doing such extensive analysis to find out what they want. So that's another thing we discussed that uh, when we were in GCC. Okay. Um, I guess if there are not any questions, uh, one other thing we wanted to discuss was uh, coming up with this uh, once a month uh, ML meeting. 
Um, and this is what Jeremy suggested at GCC. I think it's a great idea because there are different people who are working on ML applications and we don't know about what every other person is doing. So if we have a monthly or maybe bi-monthly meeting, uh, people can share what they're doing. So everyone knows what everyone else is doing. Uh, we could exchange ideas, possibly collaborate. And there are a lot of people not directly in the Galaxy team who are interested as well. Uh, I think uh, Stephen Shank uh, from Temple University, he said he, well, he's interested, he wants to attend. Uh, obviously there's uh, all the, you know, Penn State, Hopkins, Oregon, uh, Cleveland, Freiburg, all the folks there. They, they, they've, they've showed interest and also there are some people from outside, uh, you know, that want to attend. So, uh, I mean, I could send a doodle to pick a date. I didn't know that the community call was this week. Maybe we can have the ML, ML meeting, monthly ML meeting on a different week so it doesn't overlap. If any, anybody has any thoughts on this, it would be great to hear about them. It sounds like a great idea. Okay. Good. Yeah, thanks. I'll try to, uh, I mean, I'll send the doodle to everyone. And I mean, every one or two people from, I, I have a name of folks that I know are interested, but if you know someone else who's interested, we can share it with them as well. See. Should you maybe, if you add this to the primary working group calendar, people might uh, discover it as well? That, that's actually a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. We could, yeah. Do, that. We could do that. Yeah. So that, I'll, I will do that. When, when the date time is decided, I'll, I'll add that there. And, uh, thanks. Well, thanks so much, Kevin, for the awesome presentation and um, everyone for their questions in this discussion. Um, the next community call is going to be in two weeks on August 18th. Um, and the topic for that call is going to be the outcomes of the outreach project. So that'll be the outreach and mentors uh, and interns presenting. Um, and we'll uh, also be sure to do a little bit more uh, notice ahead of time for folks so that it's um, kind of on the top of mind for that it would be upcoming that day. Um, so thanks for everybody attending um, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye.